I'm ready. Okay, we're live. We welcome all you guys that are down in the mountains watching or all over the United States or somewhere in the world. And those of you that will get this podcast sometime this week. Certainly all you guys that are here in the building. We welcome a good crowd here today for Bible study on a Thursday at lunchtime. So I'm encouraged by that. Uh, we're going to start in Luke chapter 5. <clears throat> we'll pick up with verse 17. But let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for this time we have together. We thank you for all your blessings that you've given us. And uh, we thank you for your grace, your long-suffering. We thank you for your forgiveness. We just thank you for the way you've loved us and the way you've given us the resources we've needed. And we've tried to uh, be good stewards and faithful to take care of the things you've put in front of us and ask us to do. And we just ask that this message would go out not because it's us it's not our message it's your message and we're none of us here should receive any glory it should all be all the glory should be given to you and we ask that as we work through here that we would become more like you in jesus name amen all right so uh hearing about uh for those of you that are live now we're live uh the my surgeon the one some of you heard some of that testimony uh will be here in december to speak and share her story. So uh, we'll give you some more information on that as we get closer. Here in a couple of weeks, on the 25th, we won't have Bible study. We'll have a cookout that day. So invite people in the community, somebody you work with, bring them by here, let them see we don't bite. They might come, they might come to church, right? And then we'll just, uh, just reel them in a little bit and then set the hook, right? <clears throat> Let's go to Luke chapter 5, uh, verse 17. <clears throat> Now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching uh, Jesus uh, that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by uh, who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, They went up on the housetop and led him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. So there's a lot going on there. Uh, But the first thing I want to say to you, I want to remind you of this. This is the word in the New Testament that we use to undergird all faith and believing. It is the word pisteo. And the noun form you'll see a lot is pistis, but, the, but this is undergirds believing in faith. And it verbs require, and you know this from English, however many years ago you were in class. <laughs> uh, we won't talk about that. They require action. That's what you're seeing. These guys believed that Jesus could do what they needed, and so they put feet under them, and they worked it out to get... That's the, they, their faith was not just a mental understanding. They walked it out. They said, we're going to get our friend in front of Jesus. And obviously, they were going to do whatever it took. And they were saying a lot by this, right? They're saying they were obligating themselves, not only to their friend, to get him there and get him in front of Jesus, but also to... Uh, to redo whatever they had to mess up. They, they messed up this guy's roof. So they committed to repairing that. Everything. So this is pisteo at work here. This is active faith. They're not just sitting home uh, doing nothing. They're actively getting out, making a move toward Jesus with their friend so he might be healed. And we see that with folks who put feet underneath what they believe and walk it out, work it out. Over uh, in Nigeria, some of you have probably seen this video or maybe a clip out of it when Reinhard Bonnke had a service and the guy was raised from the dead over there. He he was uh, actually a pastor himself, the guy who was raised from the dead, and he had had a car wreck, and two of the physicians in Nigeria had signed his death certificate. He was in the morgue for three days. He was in the mortuary for three days. His wife had received a word from God earlier that year, and it was a word that God quickened to her. And you understand, there's a, there's a Logos word and there's a Rhema word. 
A logos word is when you read and it's truth and you believe it and you apply it to your life. But a rhema word is when the Holy Spirit quickens something to you and you know that it's for you in that moment. It's a, it's a word that's been revelated to you for your situation, your moment. Sometimes you hear that in prayer. Sometimes you'll read something and you'll know the Holy Spirit is dropping that in on you for your moment, for your situation. And so she believed that in Isaiah. And the scripture she was using was the one that said she understood it, that there would be no violations in her home. And so she felt like her husband dying was a violation to her home. Her children were losing a father. and So she went and got him out of the mortuary, took him to Reinhardt. Now, Reinhardt Bonnke uh, has passed away since in the last few years. I heard him speak uh, in Louisville, right before he passed away, one of the last times he spoke, as he was telling us, he, he knew his time was coming. He was a lot like Paul. Uh, he was handing the mantle off to another man for the ministry. And, uh, but he, I, was, I got to hear him speak for one. And he had lots of miracles. That's how God used him in Africa. He had blinded eyes open. A lot of stuff happened in his, his services. Uh, <clears throat> but in this particular service, she... She put action to her belief, right? She went and got her husband out of the mortuary, had him took to this meeting, and they were, she was trying to get him in the meeting, and, of course, the guys in charge wasn't letting her bring him in because they thought it might be a terrorist attack. They thought they were trying to bring a bomb in. And so they, she finally told them what the situation was, so they opened the casket, went through it thoroughly, and decided to let her bring him in, but they took him down in the basement where Reinhardt Bonnke was preaching upstairs. There were thousands of people there. That's the crowds that they have in Africa. And they started praying for him. And uh, while they were having a meeting upstairs, and he came back to life. This is documented. The, they, they've got all, they took him back to the doctors. They were freaking out. They're like, because they had signed off on his death certificate. And so... Uh, but she exercised faith, right? She didn't just sit at home and say, woe is me, and my husband's dead, and God said I would, and she just stood on faith and took him in. He raised from the dead, and they, they brought him upstairs after he raised from the dead, and uh, they said the Holy Spirit just consumed that place, and people started getting healed all over the place. Said people had been crippled for years, were throwing their crutches up in the air and taking off running. And he said that uh, the guy that was in charge of this ministry said he remembered one woman in particular. She had been crippled and diseased forever. She threw her crutches up in the air, started running and worshiping and praising God. And she was running toward her husband, he said. And she, he said he watched all that, said her, she was going to hug her husband and rejoice and Said her husband threw up his hand, said, Don't touch me, don't touch me, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner. And he ran to the altar, give his heart to the Lord. People were just repenting because God showed up. And but it started with one woman who said, I'm not going to be denied. What if we lived with that kind of faith right there? She said, and that's what that's what's happening here. Do you think about it? Uh, let me ask you a question. If you knew the Holy Spirit was alive and doing was really had fallen anywhere in a building and you got there and couldn't get in, but you had a need, would you find a way in or would you just turn and go home? Say, they ain't got no room for me here. See, I think that's where we got to push through, right? And, and live. And I'm talking to myself too, not talking down to anybody. And when he saw their faith, he said to him, man, your sins are forgiven. So Jesus goes to the greatest need first, right? Because... You can get to heaven if you live your life in a wheelchair, but you can't get there if your sins are not forgiven, right? So the first need that this guy has is spiritual, right? He needs to be forgiven. So Jesus goes, at, the guy's paralytic, right? But Jesus, And that's why they're bringing him. But Jesus says, hey, let me deal with this most important thing first, right? He says, man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Well, there he is. It's Emmanuel, right? You remember me saying, I think I said it maybe in this setting last week, that when they said to Jesus, you're, uh, you're good, and he said, there's none good but one, he wasn't saying he wasn't good, 
the problem the Jews had, they would call him a good teacher or a whatever. Some of them call him a prophet or whatever. But he was saying, because Jesus was perfect, he was better than good. <laughs> but he, a lot of people misinterpret that. He wasn't saying he wasn't good. He said, there's only one good. He was saying, if you're recognizing me as good, then you've got to recognize me as part of the Godhead. And that was their stumbling block. See, they didn't want to recognize him as the Son of God. They, re, they resisted that. And so he wasn't saying he wasn't good. Jesus was perfect. He was more than good. Uh, but he was saying, if you recognize me as good, you've got to recognize me as the Messiah, the, the only begotten Son. So they, they're, they're, they're uh, upset because he's forgiven sins, but he's part of the Godhead. Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. He is here in the flesh. Emmanuel, God with us. But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? See, <laughs> he knows what we're thinking. And he says, Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Rise up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. So he did answer their prayer. He, he went for the greatest need first, right? Then he answered their prayers, uh, or the reason they'd brought him there. And you notice how that's flipped in our world today? Back then, they were okay with people getting healed, but somebody forgiving their sins, you know, that tore their world. Now it's like, we're okay with people getting forgiven, but you say somebody's got healed, you know, and so it's, it's kind of how the enemy works. He just always wants to cause confusion. Immediately he arose up before them, took up uh, what he had been lying on, departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed and they glorified God and, filled, and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I think we're getting into a culture like that again. Because we live, our, our world is a godless culture. We are, true believers are in, the, in a small minority, not everywhere now. And uh, I think one of the last statistics I wrote, read was that in America, they say 13% of Americans are what they would call committed Christians. That you can tell that they are followers. They go, they attend worship, church, they give. You can see it in their life that they're committed to that. 13%. Of Americans, committed Christians. That's staggering to think about that. So uh, they, they're all in amazement saying strange, strange things have happened today. After these things, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting in the tax office and said to him, follow me. So he left all, rose up and followed him. So he goes after an IRS guy. He knows the heart, right? And I shared some of this when we were going through Easter season, resurrection time. You understand in, in Jerusalem and in those areas, a lot of Jews were seen as traitors. They took jobs for Rome, collecting taxes off the Jews and giving it to the Romans. Levi is, Matthew's the most unlikely guy, and Jesus calls him. Some of the Jewish people become soldiers in the Roman army. So when, when Jesus was crucified, there was all kinds of, I would just call them this, political factions. People, that's, most of them hated, the groups dissented toward each other. I, hate's probably a strong word. Some, that was probably involved with some of them. But they, they didn't get along at all until they all rallied together to hate Jesus. The Herodians didn't care about the Pharisees, and the Pharisees sure didn't care about the Sadducees, and turn that around and go right back the other direction. And then you got these guys that are, working for the IRS, which is basically benefiting Rome. And they're mad probably about taxes and all that. Uh, they've got a temple tax, all that kind of stuff coming on. So there's just a lot of stuff going on within that. Fine. And here comes Jesus and says, I want you. Now imagine what that did for him. The Jews were, res were resisting him as the Messiah, or were going to. And then he's got somebody that they view as a traitor. As one of his dudes. God has a sense of humor, don't he? And he also knows the heart. He knew Matthew's heart. And so he, he calls him out. And uh, uh, he says, uh, 
calls him from the uh, tax table, the tax office, and said, follow me. And Levi gave him a great feast uh, in his own house, and there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with him. So the high, whole IRS team has showed up. Uh, and they're scribes. Now think how you would think about that. What if you were an innocent bystander and you're thinking, this guy's supposed to be the Messiah and he's hanging out with the dudes that hate us, right? Uh, but he says, right, he says, it's not the, the well that need a physician, it's those who are sick, right? And he says, uh, the, the tax collectors, others sit down, their scri and their scribes and Pharisees complained against his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Aren't you glad Jesus eats with tax collectors and sinners? We needed to have lunch with Jesus at our, sometime in our life, didn't we? And Jesus answered and said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He was being nice there, but the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not good, not any. So we all, ha we all need to have lunch with Jesus. Um... And then he said to them, why do you, why did, they said to him, why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers and likewise those of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink? He said to them, can you make uh, the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them and they will fast in those days. So they're rejoicing now. They're hanging out with Jesus, right? They're, they're feasting. But that day was coming. And if you'll remember, Jesus said this uh, while he was here on earth. He said, and hear this because it's, it's real. And I think we should all let this sink down into our ears. He said, they're going to be fasting. So Jesus assumed that his followers would fast. Fasting's really good for us. It breaks bondages. It, it gets our minds in tune with the Lord. It puts the flesh in its place because that's the strongest appetite we have. The one that's the quickest renewed is the desire to eat. So you're really subject, you're killing the flesh, quote unquote, with that. But there's a place where Jesus said while he was here, he said, when you pray, when you fast, and when you give. He didn't say if you pray, if you fast, or if you give. Those were not optional. He, he said when he, in other words, there was an expectation by Jesus that the people who followed him, they would fast, they would pray, and they would give. And those are all characteristics of Jesus too, right? He was a prayer. He certainly was a faster. He fasted for 40 days. And he was a giver because he gave his own, his own life so that we could have eternal life. So he's not asking nothing of us uh, that he didn't be extreme about he was extreme in all three of those areas you think about it because when he would get pressed all day long he thought prayer was so important that if he didn't get time to pray he'd pray all night and forget sleeping we know what kind of faster he was and he was confronted with satan right after that when his flesh was weak and all that 40 days and then we know what kind of giver he was because he hung his he let his he laid his own life down so what little bit he asked of us from those areas is probably never going to equate to what he's done for us in that. And uh, I'm sure Jesus fasted more than we know, but we know of the one 40-day the one fast. But, so when you hear that, it's not if, it's when. So there's a, a level of expectation. And, and even in this, he said, uh, oh, they'll be fasting when, I, when I'm not around. And he spoke a parable to them. No one puts a piece of new garment on an old one. Otherwise, a new makes a tear. And also, the piece that was taken out of the new does not match the old. And no one puts new wine in old wineskins, or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled, and the wineskins will be ruined. But new wine must be put in new wineskins, and both are preserved. And no one having drunk old wine immediately desires... Uh, no one having drunk old wine immediately desires new, for he says, the old is better. When I first started pastoring, a, a, an old pastor that had been around a while shared something with me, and I, I remember this. He said, 
Remember, people don't jump into change, they crawl into it. And, and that's not just true in the church, it's true of anything, right? You, anything that changes, people resist or they're hesitant, you know, and I've been like that. Do you know how long it was before I ever sent my first text? I wish I'd have never done. I, just, <laughs> I said, I had a rule. I said, if you want to talk to me, you call me. I, I lived that way for several years with a, with a cell phone. Uh, but, you know, we don't, we, we're, and, and I know we're all the, but we're, we all are like that in some ways or some areas of our lives, right? Uh, when you and I, we it comes out. Our speech betrays us. It comes out of our own mouths that we're resistant to change. And you may think, well, I, I didn't resist that change. But if you look around your whole life, there's probably some areas you resisted. Some of them I'm still resisting. You know, things that I, I mean, I do not, and I'm old fashioned this way. I do not want to give up paper money, but it's coming. It's coming, right? I don't want to give up my ability to go pay somewhere and everybody not know my business. Every time you throw a credit card down or what, and I know I use credit cards. I'm not saying that, but we're losing our autonomy really fast. And it bothers me. My, my grandmother did not have a lot of money. She's dead and gone, so I can tell this now. But she had, had a big cellar. Does anybody know what a cellar is? <laughs> Everybody knows what a cellar is. <clears throat> she had money in, a coffee, in coffee cans. She went through the Depression. So she put her money in the coffee can in the cellar. Well, it started, it rottened. She had to call the Federal Reserve and give the numbers and get that money. <laughs> Some, it was, it's funny now, but it wasn't funny back then. So you see what kind of stock I come from. I just don't have a seller. <laughs> and I don't have any money because I raised three children and they all three got married and I had to pay for all that. So now I'm hoping I'll have some money in the next few years. But... Uh, college and all but you see the stock I come out and so whenever I go to a restaurant nine times out of ten I pay cash I don't want somebody get my number I don't want to sit there and wait another 20 minutes for somebody to run my credit card I'll throw my money down and walk out I like the convenience of that but I know I know we're going to lose that sooner or later uh, but so we're all resisting. Jesus is talking about that. But he's giving us a spiritual lesson here too. If you're going to get new wine, which is the Holy Spirit, you're going to have to get a new wine skin, which is what Jesus does, right? We're born again. We need a new life. And so in order for the Lord to pour his spirit into us, he needs a new wine skin. And that wine skin is when Jesus changes our life, when he brings salvation. And so, he, then he goes on, he said, nobody wants this immediately. And again, you're talking about people transitioning from the law. You, and I try to help us, remind us of how difficult that might be. If you're trained your whole life to uh, sacrifice and take sacrifice, and all of a sudden, somebody shows up and says, I'll be the final sacrifice, that'd be a hard pill to swallow. And I've shared this, it's been a while, but <clears throat> when I met with some Orthodox Jews in Cincinnati about three or four years ago, I had a meeting with them. And one of the guys that sat across from me was, you know, he'd done a lot of the talking and I, I felt like I was supposed to listen. And he knew I was a believer and I, was, I said, uh, you know, as a Christian, but he was, he was trying to get me to understand him. And it, it helped me. It really helped me understand. He said, can you understand how it is for us as Orthodox Jews to grow up our whole life and hearing this is what Moses taught us and this is what God told Moses and we, we take that seriously. And then all of a sudden a guy shows up on the scene and says, you've heard it said, but I say unto you. He said, that's the difficult challenge for us. And that, when he went through all that and I listened. I felt like I was supposed to listen and it helped me get an understanding because I deal with Orthodox Jews. And I thought, this is a moment of teaching for me to kind of get some perspective here. But I got the last word. You know, I am a preacher. And uh, 
I like to talk. <laughs> but uh, I said to him, I said, have you ever thought about Joseph? And he said, no. I said, what do you mean? I said, well, he had a special coat. He was betrayed by his brothers. And he was sold for silver. I said, Jesus had a special garment. He was betrayed by his brothers and he was sold for silver. And he looked at me from across the table and he said, I never have. And he got up, took his scarf, it was winter time, put his scarf around him, his coat on, his hat, and he walked out the door. But the seed was planted. We plant, we water. God has to give the income. I'm feeling the Lord right now because I believe that a seed was planted in there. And you've heard those testimonies, haven't you? Have you heard Glenn Campbell's testimony? How he'd be off in these cities giving his concerts and half lit. And he'd be, he, was, he used cocaine for a while and everything. And he would turn these TV's preachers on in his hotel room at night and get under conviction. <laughs> and then finally God set the hook on him and reeled him in. <laughs> so that's how God worked. Listen, I, I've got to the place in my life that I'm so thankful that God revealed his son to me. You, you understand how blessed we are for God to reveal himself to us? We didn't find God. That's not how this works. The sheep don't run around saying, where's the shepherd out? The sheep will run right off a cliff. The shepherd finds the lost sheep. We got that mixed up. And I know what people mean when they testify and say, I found the Lord. I, get, I understand that. I'm not trying to be critical of that. But we don't really find the Lord. <laughs> he comes to us, opens our eyes, reveals himself to us, and then we have a decision to make. That's kind of what happened to Glenn Campbell. Happens to a lot of people over time. God's after them. Do you know how much God has come after you and I with his Holy Spirit? You know that. You know when you've run. or You know when you've backed away and the Holy Spirit's just right there. You get up and try to brush your teeth and the Holy Spirit's already in the bathroom when you walk in. Or you try to go to sleep and the Holy Spirit's sitting on the edge of the bed. <laughs> you, know? Uh, you know how much He's been after us. You know that from personal experience. Well, he's just, He loves everybody. He don't just love us. And so I'm thankful that my eyes were open, aren't you? <clears throat> so now it happened on the second. The Pharisees are watching, right? They're wanting to put Jesus down. And So it happened on the Sabbath, the first, that He went through the grain fields and His disciples plucked the heads of grain and, and ate them, rubbing in their hands, rubbing them in their hands. And some of the Pharisees said to them, Why are you doing what is not lawful for you to do on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered them and said, Have you not read this, what David did when he was hungry? He who uh, he and those who were with him, how he went into the house of God, took and ate the showbread, and also gave some to those with him, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And he said to them, The Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. So he, he tells us in another place that we, Sabbath wasn't, man wasn't made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for us. God set it up that way for our benefit. David got by with this. He shouldn't have got by with this. But the reason he got by with this is he had an understanding that God was after a relationship. It wasn't a set of legal system that he, he wanted a relationship. And that's why he said, David is a man after my own heart. You find some people like Abraham, David, some other people in the Old Testament that have a New Testament revelation. They, they understood that God was all about relationship. In fact, Abraham was before the law. So it was all about relationship then and all about faith, faith and relationship. The law just come to reveal to us our need for a Savior and the fact that we couldn't get there on our own. But it's always been about faith and relationship. That, that's how it all started. And God went after a Gentile first. Abraham was a Gentile. He, later his line became known as the Jews. But God loves all of us. And how he comes after us and reaches for us. <clears throat> and so they're, they're think about David. He understood God wanted a relationship. And so he was able to uh, get in, walk in there and eat the showbread. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. Saul did not understand that. Saul was about legalistic. And then I say, you all have heard me say this maybe before, politics started with Saul. Because when, when uh, Samuel come to him and said, have you done everything the Lord told you to do? And Saul said, yes. And then all of a sudden, 
When he said yes, Samuel heard, meh. <laughs> and Samuel said, well, why do I hear these sheep? Because he's supposed to wipe it all out, right? And so Samuel said, uh, you've not obeyed the Lord. Half obedience is no obedience. And so he said, here's what Saul said. I wanted the people. I feared the people. And so that's where politics started. When a man, could have been a woman, but it was a man. When a man decided that he cared more about what people thought than what God thought. And that's where it all kicked off. And so he got confronted and lost his position. Now David did some horrendous things. In fact, you might would say that the things David did wrong numbered more than what Saul did wrong. So what's the difference? I want you to think about this. When I was raising my children, I had certain expectations out of them, but I know sometimes the week gets away or something can interfere with that. And I may come in and say, why, why didn't you mow the grass today? Because they're supposed to mow it every week. And they may say, well, I had a big test and I couldn't get to it today or whatever. <clears throat> but if I, if I knew they were going to be home or I knew the time was allotted and I looked at them before... I left the house and said, I want you to do something specific today, and when I get home, it better be done. And when I got home, if it wasn't done, they were in trouble. Okay, I think that's God. We have governance. He's given us boundaries and governance that some of us let go at times or miss at times. But when God gives you a direct order for you, you better follow through with it. And that's what Saul didn't do. God gave him a direct command. God already had commands seated all around his people. And sometimes people fail in them. And sometimes people do the wrong thing. And sometimes people don't measure up. They let something go. That's what David did. He got caught up. and started. But God came to Saul and said, You do this and this. And Saul just decided not to. Because he... Cared more about, this is where politicians fly, most of them, not all of them, most of them fly right here. Because he cared more about what people thought than what God thought. And sad to say, some pastors, a lot of pastors are like that anymore. They care more about what people think than what God thinks. And that's where we draw the line. It's where we draw the line with laws. We, uh, the Bible tells us to obey the laws of land. When I get caught speeding... I don't never try to talk them out of a ticket. I realize I've broken the law. And, I, and sometimes if they let me off, I'm praying. I'm not saying I'm not praying to get out of it. I, I just <laughs> uh, I've been pulled over so much. That, you know how when you get... My wife is still like this. When blue lights get in behind somebody or get in behind us, it makes her all nervous and tense. I've been pulled over so much, it don't even bother me. I just roll on off the road. <laughs> but I, I realize they're there doing their job for a reason, right? So we're told to obey the laws of the land until those laws conflict with God's. That's where we draw the line and say, and if it costs us our lives or if it costs us to have to go to jail, then God's got a purpose for all that. You know, God can get just as much glory out of when we're battling as he does when we're on top of the mountain. Because a lot of people look at us and say, well, everything's going your way. No wonder you're serving the Lord. But when they see us in the throes of the battle and we're still hanging on to God, that might minister to them more than others. That satellite in the mountains came out of an ALS sickness. I started having services with a guy that returned to the Lord during his illness, ALS, and people started gathering there, praying for him. We started having discipleship and fellowship, and that's why that satellite's down there. Because one guy opened his house up in the middle of his misery and let people come in. And God took that misery and that horrible disease, and it's, I've seen a lot of death because of my position in 30-some years, and that's, that's the worst way I've seen anybody pass away. It's just a horrible thing but God took that horrible thing renewed this guy's relationship with him he he forgave everybody he was such a had such a good attitude and then this whole ministry down there was birthed out of that 
So God can use our bad moments. Listen, He's God on the mountaintop, and He's just as much God in the valley as He is in the mountaintop. Amen. So He says, uh, So the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Now it happened on another Sabbath. <laughs> is Jesus doing this on purpose? <laughs> also that He entered the synagogue and taught, and a man was there whose right hand was withered. And so the scribes and Pharisees watched Him closely whether He would heal on the Sabbath that they might find an accusation against him. But he knew their thoughts and said to them, imagine being in a circle with Jesus. You don't even have to talk. He knows exactly what you're thinking. And he said to the man who was on the withered hand, arise and stand here. And he arose and stood there. Then Jesus said to them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? To save life or to destroy? So they're, they're, right there, he's pushing back against them, right? He's not calling anybody. He's not singling anybody out, but he's just pushing back. And when he had looked around to them all, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. But they were filled with rage and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Really? They're going to kill God? <laughs> they don't know. What, they're, they're blind. You're going to kill God. Whose idea is that? <laughs> you know, I love that psalm. I think it's Psalm 2. When we're coming to the end of time and it says the kings of the earth are getting together of how they can do away with God. And the Bible says, he who sits in the heavens shall laugh. Right. He's going to laugh about it. And um, we don't find a lot of scripture where God talks about laughing, but that's one of them. Ever himself laughing. Uh, but he said he's going to laugh when the people down here decide they're going to try to overthrow him. <laughs> Satan, that didn't work for Satan. He, the Bible says he fell like lightning. Now that's fast. I mean, I can just see Satan stand up and saying, well, I'm getting ready, and he couldn't get another word out. I, I'd say Michael went over there and grabbed him and just threw him out of heaven. And Jesus said, Jesus said, Jesus the one told us, I, I, I watched him fall. Like lightning. So that, that's not going to work out for the kings, whoever's left and thinks they're going to overthrow God. And uh, so he, they're going to try to kill Emmanuel. <laughs> now it came to pass in those days that he went into the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself. I see the Bible a little different maybe than some would see. Some people... I don't see Jesus going from one place of ministry to the other and praying. I see Jesus going from one place of prayer to the next and ministering in between. He knew how important it was to be with the Father. He, that, and we all got to see that. And I, I, heard, I heard this early on ministry when, from another pastor who was seasoned. said, the problem with the churches today, we got men trying to go up in the pulpit instead of coming down into it. They're trying to get on the internet and find out something catchy and snazzy to say and something that'll be uh, relevant to the culture. And he said, instead of men coming out of the presence of God to speak to the people. And that's what we're lacking in a lot of pulpits today. Men are not spending enough time with God. They're just trying to be catchy or edgy. And... Nothing. I like what Watchman Nee says. He says, you can tell a story and it may be relevant to what you're teaching. And, you, and there may be some good things to share. He says, but unless you use the word of God, you are not touching the spirit of man. It's the only thing that penetrates to the spirit. You may move their emotions. You may move their soulish man. But until you use the word of God, you're not... And when you think about that with ourselves, we need to think about that when we're witnessing to others. Uh, he, so he, he heals the guy, and it came to pass. He went out and prayed, and he, he calls the disciples, and from them he chose twelve, whom he also named apostles. So he, there's more there, obviously, but he picked twelve of them. Simon, who was surnamed Peter, Andrew, his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called the zealot and Judas the son of James and Judas Iscariot, who also became a traitor. It says he became a traitor. It's interesting. 
Uh, then he came down. I don't know what he was watching, but he didn't seem to, however he got misled. Uh, love of money, maybe a bunch of things played into that. He came down with them and stood on the level place of the crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and from the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and, he, and, he, and to be healed of their diseases as well as those who were tormented with unclean spirits. And they were healed and the whole multitude sought to touch him for power went out of him and healed them all. So everybody was starting to get the message that somebody had shown up with the authority of God. He lifted up his eyes toward his disciples and said, and here's, here's the, what we call uh, the Beatitudes. No. He says, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and cast, you, cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for indeed your reward is great in heaven, for in like manner their fathers did the prophets. <clears throat> Let's go over to Matthew and read. Matthew gives us a little more detail <clears throat> about this. Is it Matthew 6 or 7? Five. Okay. Um, let's, let's read these. Now, I've, I've preached and I feel like the Holy Spirit taught me something several years ago. That this is the progressive walk of a believer. This is how it works. This is how the, the, the Spirit works in our life. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. When you realize your spiritual need and you're born again, that's when you have the kingdom of God. So that has to happen. None of these other things can happen if that first beatitude don't happen. Blessed. Recognizing, basically the best way to say that, and the Greek word for blessed is markarios. It means receiver of divine favor, right? That, so... Markarios, we're talking about receiving favor from God. And he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So that's where we start our journey. The rest of this stuff would not happen until we recognize our need spiritually. We realize our need. Then the next one, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. I think these things can stand alone. You can look back at one of these and take comfort from it. But I also think the, the Holy Spirit does nothing unintentional. These are in an order for a reason. And he says, blessed are those who mourn. Notice the next thing that happens in most people who come to Christ. Uh, they mourn. They mourn how they live. How many times have you heard somebody say, man, I wish I'd have come to Christ. I hate what I used to be. You know, I hate that I wouldn't pay attention. I hate that I lived my life the way I did. Uh, one of the guys in Florida that goes to the church of a good friend of mine, the homosexual, his house burned down, and I told him he was a flaming home. I mean, he wanted to, he looked apart, and uh, after he got born again, he, he told my friend, he said, I hate, I hate how I used to live. It makes me sick to think how I used to live. So there is a period of that. You you know, I have to deal with people that get born again. They, they, they feel that. They feel that mourning that, oh, man, I wish I hadn't lived that way. And some of them even said, what's the Lord going to say to me? I said, now that you're born again, he's going to say, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> he's cast that sin as far as the east is from the west. But we do feel that, the weight of it. And then, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Humility sets in. I think when you're born again, you realize how God saved you out of sin, that that helps us come bring, it helps bring humility in our lives. Uh, blessed, then what happens? We start hungering and thirsting. Listen, look at you all. And those of you that are watching and listening. Thursday? You took time out of your Thursday because you hunger for God's Word? That's awesome. And that happens. We start hungering and we're recipients of divine favor as we walk through this process. 
Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. I think it's James that says mercy triumphs over judgment. We got time. Ain't nobody going nowhere. You hear that? <laughs> Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Uh, I had another old time preacher say to me when I first got started, he said, uh, here's you some advice. He gave me two pieces of advice. He said, give out plenty of mercy because you're going to need it yourself someday. And he said, the other advice he gave me, he said, don't run the roads chasing people that don't want to serve God anyhow and neglect the sheep that God has set in the church. He said, don't be chasing people that's just want, not wanting really to serve God anyway. And, uh, and then he says, blessed are the pure in heart. So see what's happening. This process is unfolding in our lives from beginning of salvation to getting the word. And Paul said, and sanctification leads us to more purity, more righteousness, if you want to say it that way. Uh, and how are we sanctified? Paul told us we're sanctified by the washing of the water of the word. So that's what's happening there in verse 6, right? And that beatitude, we're hunger and thirst for righteousness. So that word's coming in and, the, and we're merciful. We're showing freely you receive, freely you start getting revelation. Wow, look at the mercy I've been given. I need to give it away. And then our hearts become pure toward God. We're going to see God. And then we're maturing to the place to where we're not so much as trying to find a side to take as we are of being a peacemaker. Not a peacekeeper. It's harder to be a peacemaker than a peacekeeper. Peacekeeper somebody steps into a moment and keeps it steady. A peacemaker is somebody goes into a mess and brings it back to peace. For they shall be called the sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I don't believe you can... Live out verse 10 if you're not grounded in these other things. Because when you get persecuted, if you're not careful, it'll make you angry, bitter, instead of rejoicing. The Bible tells us we're supposed to rejoice. And I don't know why we just think this verse is not applicable anymore. But Jesus said to all of us, they hated me, they're going to hate you. Now, I know none of us like that. I don't like it either. I don't like conflict. I deal with it. I'm not, I'm not, I don't shy away from conflict. But I don't, I don't like it. Who likes it? Nobody likes conflict if they're in their right, unless maybe you're a boxer or something. Uh, you've seen that one guy right in the high school that enjoys fighting as much as the rest of us do fishing. There's, a, there's some guys out there like that. But they're few and far between. Uh, blessed are those who persecute. So you're not going. If you're not understanding mercy, if you're not seeking God, if your heart's not pure, if you're not humble, if you're if you're not going through this process, you're probably not going to make it when you get persecuted. And if you think about the power of the parable of the sower, he talks about that. Some people hang in there till they get persecuted, and then they walk off. Uh, and he says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then he says another one. Blessed are you when, the, when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. You cannot answer your critics. They don't care. And this culture is way worse than it's ever been. They don't care if they're telling the truth or not. They don't care if they've got the facts or not. They, they will run each other's lives with lies. They don't care. I heard a politician say one time, I watched him getting interviewed, and he lied about another politician. And I'm not saying that, that the other guy was righteous or anything, but he lied. And the news reporter or the person that was interviewing him confronted him and showed him the evidence and said, you know, that was false. Everything you said was false. And you know what his response was? It worked, didn't it? That's the culture we live in. So if you try to spend your time defending yourself, you're going to waste a lot of time. They're going to lie. And it's going to get worse because we're in a minority. True believers 
are in a minority. And if we live for God, it causes conviction to run, run toward other people. If we're going to live this right, and some people will yield to that conviction, and some people are going to get mad about that conviction. That's just reality. So the uh, Bible says, be leery of a man that everybody speaks well of. So you need to find somebody that hates you. <laughs> Uh, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We live in a godless world now. I say this from time to time. How would you like to be God and create everything and get credit for nothing? <laughs> That's where we're at. So it's 101. I owe you a minute. Went you over, but uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time we've had together. Thank you for your word. We ask you to let that word sink down into our ears, as you said, Jesus. Let it sink down into our ears. That would cause us to be like you, more like you. In Jesus' name, amen.